with our guests from the Department of Energy. Uh, we're really grateful for their offer to come and brief us on uh, the work that they're doing this week at, at, on the site. Um, we are going to be recording this meeting so that uh, those on the DOB who were unable to attend will be able to um, benefit from the presentation that we hear tonight, today, rather. Um, so maybe we should start by just going around and introducing ourselves. Um, my name is Tom Congdon. Um, I work at the New York State Department of Public Service, um, and as part of my role there, I, I chair the Indian Point Closure Task Force and the Decommissioning Oversight Board. Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Ryan Coyne, and uh, I'm a lawyer in the Department of Public Services uh, Office of General Counsel. Uh, good morning, Dennis Del Borgo, Director of Emergency Management, the County's Department of Emergency Services. Hi, Susan Spear, Deputy Commissioner, Westchester County Department of Emergency Services. Uh, Dave Lockbaum, a technical consultant to the, De the Decommissioning Oversight Board. Good morning, I'm Kelly Turturro. I'm the Regional Director for New York State Department of Environmental Conservation's regional office that covers the Hudson Valley, including Westchester. I am Commissioner Basil Sagos' representative on the Decommissioning Oversight Board. Good morning, my name is Adam Levin. I'm a consultant to PNNL. Good morning, everyone. I am Virgil Peoples. I'm from Idaho National Laboratory. I'm here supporting um, Steve Maharis and Erica Beckford for, with DOE. Good morning. I'm uh, Steve, Steve Maharis, and I'm from uh, uh, Pacific Northwest National Laboratories, and I um, organize the site evaluation teams, and we're very happy to be at Indian Point this week. Good morning, everyone. My name is Erica Bickford. I'm the acting director of the Office of Integrated Waste Management within the Office of Nuclear Energy at the U.S. Department of Energy. I'm Elise Peterson with NYSERDA. Um, I have an umbrella nuclear coordination responsibility to uh, coordinate uh, all, all things atomic energy in the state. Um, I'm also the state's uh, liaison to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and other federal agencies such as DOE. Good morning. I'm Richard Arnold. I'm a Native American, Southern Paiute from Nevada, and um, been involved with the uh, evaluation team, and I, I serve as the chairman of the, or chairperson of the um, Tribal Radioactive Materials Transportation Committee, and I'm amazed by all the greenery that you guys have because I'm from the desert. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Jeff Moore with the Federal Railroad Administration Hazardous, Hazardous Materials Division. It specializes in radioactive materials transportation by rail and here to support the DOE uh, team. Hi, I'm Sarah Hogan. I work with Erica Bickford at the Department of Energy, working on transportation. Good morning, Matt Feldman, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. I'm the uh, program manager that this work rolls up to at the laboratory level, supporting Erica and Sarah. And I'm Sandy Galef, a New York State Assembly member and a member of the DOB board. And I just thank you all for coming. This is going to be very interesting for us. Thank you. Teresa Knickerbocker, Village of Buchanan Mayor. Host community. Good morning. I'm Cliff Chapin, State Inspector with the Department of Public Service. Good morning. I'm Bridget Freimeyer. I'm a utility supervisor with the Department of Public Service. Great. So thank you all for being here, and I'll turn it right over to the DOE for your presentation. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, and thank you all for taking the time to meet with us on a, on a Thursday morning. Uh, I'm going to start things off and just talk a little bit about what my program is doing to pursue uh, a facility uh, capable of receiving the spent nuclear fuel from Indian Point, and then I'll hand it over uh, to Steve Maharis to talk about uh, in more depth on what we do in the nuclear power plant site evaluations. Uh, before we get too far in, I just wanted to check and see, because we got this question the other day, um, at, if people understand the difference between the U.S. Department of Energy and Pacific Northwest National Lab or Idaho National Lab. So just uh, for your information, the U.S. Department of Energy has 17 national laboratories that conduct research 
um, development, uh, scientific activities, engineering activities. Uh, Pacific Northwest National Lab is one of those. Idaho National Lab is one of those. It was mentioned at the meeting last night, Oak Ridge National Lab is doing some analysis on pipeline. That's another one. Uh, so just for that clarification, that uh, it's part of the, we consider it the DOE complex, uh, is both the federal and the, the laboratory personnel. So just to clarify that. All right. Uh, so we have a standard disclaimer. I'll leave you to your nighttime reading for that. Um, so, so our office uh, is focused on uh, the Office of Nuclear Energy is obviously promoting research and development of nuclear technology and also deploying nuclear energy as a solution for decarbonization of our electricity sector. Um, but we also understand that in order to you know, have nuclear power be a, a, a facet of the decarbonization solution, uh, we need to make progress on the back end of the fuel cycle. We need a solution for the spent nuclear fuel. Uh, it's the U.S. Department of Energy's responsibility to manage and dispose of that spent nuclear fuel from the commercial nuclear power plants, um, which includes, uh, in, in the near term, we're planning on uh, using interim storage uh, to collect the fuel and then eventually deep geologic disposal. Um, and, and we have no concerns about the spent nuclear fuel stored at the nuclear power plants around the country, but we also recognize that communities did not sign up long term to host that material indefinitely. Uh, and so it's important that the, the government fulfills its responsibility to, to remove the fuel from the sites. Uh, and so what we're doing as part of our visit this week is just, uh, so we're about probably 10 to 15 years away, if not more, um, from actually coming to pick up the fuel. So just so everyone's aware of the time frame that this is not an imminent activity, however, there is a lot of planning, coordination, and things that go on, and so we start early uh, just to get a sense of the lay of the land, and then of course, once we have more uh, definite time frames, we'll do follow-up analyses and, and act more detailed planning. So this is a very preliminary investigation at this point. Yeah? I'm sorry, 10 to 15 years away from picking up the fuel at Indian Point or the first nuclear power plant? First nuclear power plant. Thank you for the question, yeah. <coughs> All right, and so the reason that we're currently focused on interim storage is one, that's what Congress has directed us to do in the fiscal year 21 uh, Consolidated Appropriations Act. Congress provided direction to the U.S. Department of Energy to pursue uh, federal interim storage of spent nuclear fuel following a consent-based siting process. And so that is what we are currently doing. Uh, the advantages of interim storage allow for sooner removal of the spent nuclear fuel from the nuclear power plants. Uh, there's also opportunities for research on, you know, management of the fuel, aging of the fuel, inspections, things like that. Um, we recognize that the government uh, is maybe not uh, as credible as we would like to be in terms of fulfilling its responsibilities. So we also see as an opportunity to build trust and confidence in, in the government's commitment uh, to fulfill its commitments. Um, and there's also taxpayer liabilities involved, uh, you know, U.S. federal taxpayer liabilities um, that we also want to start to address. And so we're following a consent-based siting approach, um, and this is an approach that really focuses on more of a bottom-up um, type effort, starting with people and communities. You know, we've had a history of, of more top-down approaches, and, and those approaches have generally not been very successful. Uh, we've looked at, you know, similar activities in the U.S. and internationally, uh, and the, the consensus at this point in time is that consent-based approaches, voluntary approaches, uh, are ultimately more successful than, than other approaches. Again, in, in more democratic societies, at least. Uh, and so our approach is to prioritize communities and people and, and find a solution to this decades-long stalemate on, on managing the spent nuclear fuel. Um, and we think it's the, it's the right way to go at this point, um, and we think, again, it's our best chance for success. And so we kicked off this effort. We had started uh, some work on consent-based siting back in the 2015 to 20, early 2017 time period. We had an administration change that had a different policy, and so we were paused for a number of years. Then we had another administration change, um, which, which reverted in policy. Uh, and so, so that's sort of the, a little bit of the near-term timeline. Uh, but so our second iteration of consent-based siting was kicked off formally last December, December 1st. We issued a request for information. Uh, this is through the Federal Register notice. Uh, and this was just, uh, you know, on using a consent-based siting process. We had done a lot of public outreach and engagement in the 2015 to 2016 time period, um, gotten a lot of public input um, and summarized that information, but there had been an extended period of time um, that had lapsed in between. And so we wanted to reach back out and see, you know, is the information we got five years ago still current? Have people's attitudes and thoughts changed? Um, you know, is there people that didn't engage last time that have input this time? And, and that kind of thing. 
And so we got over 220 responses um, to that RFI that we are now incorporating into our approach moving forward. And these were the questions that were asked, the, the sort of high level is um, on our consent-based citing process itself, we had published a draft consent-based citing process in 2017, had gotten a few public comments on it, but it was at the tail end of that program, so we wanted to, to put it back out there for people to look at and, and give us some comments. Um, we also want to remove barriers to meaningful participation. Uh, it's probably no surprise to, to you folks, but you know the average American probably doesn't think at all about nuclear power, definitely doesn't really think much about nuclear waste or um, responsibilities for managing it or timelines or how any of that works. Um, so trying to reach a broader audience to get more input. Um, historically, you know, it's in, in small, small groups of people or that are focused on this issue and we recognize that we're missing a large population um, in those interactions. Um, we also asked about interim storage as a component of the nation's waste management system. Originally it was focused on a disposal only system um, with, with the possibility of some storage, um, with, but now with the authorization direction from Congress, uh, interim storage is now sort of the, the central focus at this period of time. And that was one of the areas where we saw attitudes change. Um, over that time period, so in the 2015 to 2016 time period, uh, there was not as much support for interim storage. There was more support for just go ahead and do the straight disposal. You know, in the intervening time where, where no progress had been made, um, it seems that uh, the feedback that we got was like interim storage is, is more, uh, people are more amenable to interim storage as, as a step forward in this process. Um, and, and as we approach um, this iteration of consent-based siting, we're also focused on ensuring issues of equity and environmental justice are built into the process as well, as well as our whole waste management system. And we define the waste management system to include the interim storage, eventual disposal, the associated transportation, as well as systems analysis um, activities as well. So our next steps in our consent-based siting activities, we are incorporating the responses that we got from that request for information. We are refining our consent-based siting process and expect to issue that soon. And we don't expect that to be a static process. We expect that to be an ever-evolving, updated uh, process as we engage with interested communities. Um, we're clarifying our broader strategy for our integrated waste management system, policies, approaches, um, more detailed planning. Um, we expect to come out with that. Uh, in, later this year as well. Um, and in the nearer term, hopefully, we plan on issuing a funding opportunity uh, for interested groups and communities to engage with the department. One of the feedback that we got is that if you want people, communities, to engage on this issue, you need to pr provide resources that allow them to do that, whether that's convening a committee, whether that's bringing in outside experts as consultants, um, whether that's doing economic studies, uh, development studies, things of that nature. And so that is the first step in supporting that effort so that we can do broader public engagement um, and, and get more, uh, more feedback um, and build understanding of this issue. And eventually we will be seeking volunteers to host facilities, but we're not at that stage yet. We're very much in the information sharing, uh, building capacity for pe enough people to understand this issue uh, to, to engage and, and make decisions on whether they want to proceed further in the process. Our goal with consent-based siting is to find one or more uh, inf informed and willing host communities. And in order to find informed and willing host communities, uh, we're, we're going through the process of, of providing that information to get them there. Uh, if you want to learn more, we have a website, energy.gov slash consent-based siting, uh, where we have public materials posted. Uh, you can subscribe uh, to our email distribution list to, to get updates. Uh, we have an email inbox that you can send questions or inquiries to that we respond to as well. Um, you can see all the comments that we got back from our RFI have been posted there, the complete comments. We're currently working on a summary of those comments that should be out uh, shortly as well. Um, we have big plans to revamp our website to be a, an information clearinghouse for this activity, so you can look for that and hopefully the near future as well. So now I'll transition a little bit more generally to talking about our planning for transport of spent nuclear fuel. And again, you know, the soonest this would start happening from any nuclear power plant is, is probably in the 10 to 15 year time period. And the exact time frame for moving fuel from Indian Point is, is to be determined. Um, but just in terms of our general planning, um, as you may be aware, uh, nearly all the commercial spent nuclear fuel that was generated at nuclear power plants resides on those sites all across the country. You can see there's a lot of nuclear power plants in the eastern U.S., in the Midwest, 
uh, and then a few on the west coast. Uh, there's 74 commercial reactor sites, and 19 of those have shut down. Is that still 19, or are we at 20 now? We are at 20 yeah, now. Because yeah. Pal <laughs> Palisade shut down in, in May. <coughs> Uh, and so regardless of where the destinations for this material are, we'll need a large scale transportation capability. So even though there's been ongoing uncertainty of whether it'll be interim storage, whether it'll be disposal and where those facilities will be located, uh, the department has been continuing to, to build, work on planning for the eventual transportation because the transportation doesn't look that different depending on where you're going. Uh, it's the same fundamental, you need transportation equipment, you need policies, you need <coughs> logistics, um, and things of that nature. Uh, and so we've been doing these nuclear power plant uh, site evaluations for the last 10 years um, and have many more to visit still. And Steve will talk more about that in his part of the presentation. Uh, so I just wanted to highlight some of our transportation planning activities um, for your awareness. And also if you've never seen it, the picture on the right uh, here is what a spent nuclear fuel cask on a rail car looks like. Um, not everybody has the, the ingrained visuals, so I find it's helpful just to share what that looks like. This is actually fuel that was moved from West Valley in New York out to the Idaho National Laboratory around the 2003-2004 time frame. What you have is a transportation cast, which is the white uh, metal cylinder, and then the, the sort of bulbous things on the end are called impact limiters that protect the end of the package. Uh, and then you have the blue part is the cradle that affixes uh, the cast to the rail car. And so the transport that we do in the future of spent nuclear fuel will primarily be by rail due to the size and weight of the packages, um, and it'll look similar to this, just to give you a visual. Uh, and so we're working on a number of, of areas of transportation planning. We have rail car development. We're building purpose-built rail cars. Uh, we have analytical tools. We do a lot of intergovernmental engagement at the federal and state and tribal levels. We recognize that states and tribes are key partners in ensuring the safe and secure transport of this material. And so we've long been engaged with them. Uh, and then Steve will talk more about the site-specific history and conditions uh, work that we collect through our site evaluations. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, we're developing purpose-built rail cars. Um, these rail cars are designed to comply with the Association of American Railroads, standard S2043. Uh, the Association of American Railroads is the standard setting organization for freight rail in all of North America, and they developed rail car standards. They developed a standard in the 1990s specific to transport of uh, high-level radioactive material, which includes spent nuclear fuel. Uh, the Navy was the first entity to build an S2043 rail card. It took them about 10 years to do. It's their most rigorous testing requirements that the AAR has. And so because of the long lead time, uh, we followed the, the Navy's example and began work on our own rail car uh, a little after they did. And so right now, we have designed and fabricated a 12-axle rail car that we call <coughs> Atlas. Uh, that's pictured in the top left. Uh, it's, the, it's a flat deck rail car, and on that is a test weight. Um, and in that picture, the, the yellow part in the middle is the, is the cradle that's holding the cask, and this particular model has uh, yellow end stops at the end as well. There's a couple different models for attachment mechanisms <coughs> for cask on rail cars. Uh, and so that rail car is out in Colorado being tested. Um, it's expected to be approved for use in 2023, and we started that project in, in about 2014. Uh, along with the Atlas rail car, we also designed buffer rail cars, which are flat deck four axle rail cars, um, intended to at a minimum separate the locomotive um, from the cast carrying rail cars and separate what's called the rail escort vehicle where security personnel will be housed uh, from the, the radioactive material in the, in the cast cars. Um, on the bottom of this uh, slide, you'll see on the bottom left, that's our rail escort vehicle. So that's where the uh, security personnel will be housed, as well as the safety and security monitoring equipment for the train. So there'll be armed guards um, with every train. Uh, this design uh, was developed by the US Navy, and we partnered with them on it. Uh, so they, the US Navy transports spent nuclear fuel from uh, aircraft carriers, the Naval Nuclear Fleet, from, and submarines. Uh, so they're our model for a lot of the rail transport operations. Um, and so they were already in the progress of developing their new rail escort vehicle. In the past, they've been using a, a modified caboose that I understand was not very comfortable. Um, and so they, uh, they had begun developing their rail escort vehicle, and we entered into an agreement with them to use the same design. Um, this, was, uh, this rail escort vehicle finished fabrication last fall. It was the second one off the line. Uh, again, the Navy uses the same one. Uh, theirs is just painted blue. Ours is painted gray. 
Uh, so in addition to those two rail cars, we also uh, have designed an eight axle uh, cast carrying rail car. And the reason we have two different cast carrying rail cars is in the uh, commercial uh, nuclear fleet in the US, uh, we currently have deployed uh, 17 different transportation packages that would be compatible with the canisters that spent nuclear fuel is stored in. Um, and they range in weights from about 90 tons to 210 tons. Um, and so that's a significant number of packages uh, to accommodate on a single type of rail car. And so the route we've gone is to design a 12 axle rail car that would be intended to carry the heavier end of the packages and an eight axle rail car that would be intended to carry on the lighter end of the packages. All right, um, in terms of computational tools, we've developed a web GIS based system called the Stakeholder Tool for Assessing Radioactive Transportation or START. Um, Sarah Hogan is now our lead for that activity. Uh, we developed this uh, initially to support our own analyses of potential routing options and looking at transportation infrastructure um, and, and what modes might be available from different uh, points of origin. Um, and it's evolved um, over the years to be used as also a communication tool um, about transportation and assets, um, also a planning tool. Uh, as I mentioned, we work with state and tribal governments. Um, the department will be providing resources to state and tribal governments that are transported through uh, technical assistance and training. Um, the START tool can be used for needs assessments to identify fire stations, police stations, hospitals around transportation routes that they might want to engage in training. Um, and we're also adding features to support environmental analysis in the future as well. Um, things like dose exposure um, from spent fuel transportation. Uh, and so we use that uh, uh, quite a bit in our team, um, and we also are continuing to develop it to, to broaden its, its utility for our, our partners as well. Uh, and lastly, I'll talk about our intergovernmental engagement. Um, and so how we engage uh, with state and tribal entities is we have established funded cooperative agreements um, with state regional groups and, uh, and a third party entity that supports the Tribal Radioactive Materials Transportation Committee that Richard mentioned he's co-chair of. Um, and so for the Northeast, including New York, is the Council of State Governments Eastern Regional Conference we have a cooperative agreement with, and they convene a committee of the Northeast Radioactive Materials Transportation Task Force, is I believe the full title. We usually just shorthand it to task force. Um, Cindy Costello from the Department of Health is the New York representative on that task force currently. And we have similar organizations set up in the Midwest and the West and the South, um, and then again the Tribal Radioactive Materials Transportation Committee. Uh, and so those cooperative agreements allow those entities to form committees of state representatives to uh, you know, conduct analysis, to uh, engage in activities within their regions, within uh, technical uh, conferences. Um, it enables them to participate in DOE's National Transportation Stakeholders Forum, or the NTSF. That's the primary mechanism the department uses uh, to engage with state and tribal governments about the department shipments of radioactive materials. And that's not just our planning for spent nuclear fuel, that's low level uh, material that the department moves, that's research quantities of spent nuclear fuel and other materials. Uh, we have a lot of federal agency coordination um, because when you're you know, looking at transporting spent nuclear fuel, long distances, there's a lot of jurisdictions. So we work closely with the Department of Transportation. We have Jeff Moore uh, from the Federal Railroad Administration who supports us. Um, we engage with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, US Coast Guard, uh, Army Corps of Engineers, uh, Department of Homeland Security, and others um, on all the various facets uh, of this transportation planning. Um, if you want to know more about the National Transportation Stakeholders Forum, um, we have uh, other federal agency participation. We have an annual meeting that we just had in Philadelphia this June. Our next meeting will be uh, next year in May in St. Louis. That's going to be hosted by the Midwest. Um, within the NTSF, we also have a number of ad hoc working groups that were stood up uh, to address specific questions or issues. These working groups are comprised of federal, state, and tribal government rep representatives. They look at things like communicating to the public about radioactive materials transportation, uh, emergency response training modules, uh, development and revision of those mo modules. Uh, a lot of the department's historical radioactive material shipment has been highway based. Um, and so the states that are on those shipping corridors are, are pretty comfortable with that model and had been involved in the development of that program. Um, they certainly see that program as a model um, to be transferred over to rail, but not everything from highway it directly transfers over to rail. So we have a rail routing ad hoc working group 
um, that's looking at questions related to rail transport and what's similar and what's different um, and, and things of that nature. And so that's been an ongoing activity uh, since uh, the NTSF was stood up in 2010 and it was sort of a continuation of a prior activity that had begun in the 1990s. Uh, so that's just a summary of, of our program planning um, in our office and our work on transportation. And now I'll hand it over to Steve to talk more about our site visit. Thank you very much. What I'm going to talk about today is the process that we use to conduct these uh, nuclear power plant site evaluations. Um, so, so the purpose of the evaluations is to support planning for the eventual removal of the spent nuclear fuel from the sites. We look at things like the inventory stored at the site. We look at things like the site conditions. And then we look at the conditions of the infrastructure around the site. And we also look at the experience that the site has in moving large, heavy things both on and off site because that could be the model for how the spent fuel moves. We um, identify ga gaps in information that we need to fill to move that fuel off site. And based on the available information, we identify options for the removal of the fuel from the site. Now, at this stage of the process, it's important to understand that we are all about options. So we don't make choices as to mode of transport. We don't make choices as to transload locations if there's no direct rail access at a site. We don't make uh, uh, decisions on routes, et cetera. At this stage, we are all about options. So sources of information that we use to conduct these evaluations, um, we first of all do a lot of research uh, before we ever go to the site. I would estimate that it takes roughly six months of research before we even set foot on a site. We want to be very well prepared. We want to uh, not waste our time at a site. We don't want to waste the site's time either. So we do a lot of prep. We look at Department of Energy do documents. We look at databases. We look at nuclear industry sources. We look at things that have been done in the past, in particular, we look at facility interface data sheets that were developed back in the early two, 2000s that describe the uh, interface of the site with the tr transportation system. We look at services pl planning documents that describe how the Yucca Mountain project thought back in the early two, 2000s the fuel might move. And then we look at various uh, do documents that supported those SPDs. We look at the facility in interface documents and the near site tra transportation infrastructure reports. So our work is built upon the, so uh, the uh, sh shoulders of others, and we try to make maximum use of the available information. All that being said, uh, we also talk with the people at the site. Uh, the independent spent fuel sto storage installation ma managers at the site are typically a great source of information for what is actually go going on at a particular site. They, they confirm information about the site. They clarify the conditions at the site. And oftentimes, they've provided detailed photos and, and, and other information about the conditions at the site. When I first started this project back in uh, 12, um, I thought that I would be able to get from reports all the information that I needed about a site. I could not have been more wrong. The reports and the documents really tell maybe 25% of the story. It's really the interfaces with people like the Indian Point site, people like the uh, railroads that serve these sites that has really bolstered the um, ability of the Department of Energy to understand the conditions at these sites. So it's not the books, it's the people. 
So uh, we also, along those same lines, talked to he heavy equipment uh, folks who have moved these large uh, objects on and off the site, like transformers, pressurizers, et cetera, because these uh, objects are of comparable size and weight to a spent fuel cask, and so their experience is very helpful in us understanding what issues arose, what constraints exist at a site, et cetera. Uh, Google Earth is my friend. When we used to go to sites, I would carry a stack of maps this tall. Now when I go to a site, I carry this, right? So um, Google Earth helps us understand layout of the site. Um, we use it to provide detailed maps of the site and the locations of features at those sites and we're able to uh, portray the locations of potential tra transload locations around the site and also potential routes that could be used to get to those locations at those sites. Um, part of our pr process is to actually go to the site. So we have done um, 18 in-person evaluations Indian Point is 19. Um, the last one that we did before COVID was Pilgrim in November of 19. We have only been able to get into the field in May of this year, so we picked up um, Dresden and Morris in Illinois. We're at Indian Point uh, this week. Um, my next target is Pat. Palisades and I hope to get that site in October of this year but we're still negotiating dates with the site. I operate um, very much with, with the um, agreement of the site, right? So we negotiate dates, we negotiate times, etc. Um, so when we go to a site we confirm aspects of the inventory at the site we, contain, we, we obtain de detailed information about the fuel that's stored at the site, and we also obtain something called canister lo load maps that tells us which specific assemblies are stored in which specific locations in which specific casts at the site. That helps us understand when those canisters could be eligible to be shipped in the future. So I can compare that information to the information on the tra transportation cask and develop a ship by date to use the term for food in the grocery store, <laughs> right? Um, so um, we observe the tra transportation infrastructure at the site we need to be able to um, move that fuel off-site, so we look at um, he heavy haul tr truck routes, we look at rail routes, et cetera. We take detailed photos at the site, and we take a lot of photos at the site. It is not unusual for us to take several thousand photos when we go to a site. We take um, still pictures at the site, we have moved towards geotagging of those photos. That makes us able to um, interface those photos with the start tool that was described so that we know exactly where that photo was taken and it can interface with start and a user can pull up a photo of that location in start. We also um, have a dashboard cam that we use to film routes so that we know the conditions of the roads. We identify things like low, low overhead bridges, other constraints in infrastructure. Um, I do not do this work alone. The Department of Energy has help. We have teammates. So we have um, the tribes are of great assistance in helping us understand tri tribal issues at the site. The uh, uh, um, um, the FRA helps us 
with our work um, understanding ra rail infrastructure at the site, so we greatly value the participation by Jeff Moore and his colleagues at the site. You know, when I call the train companies up, right, they say, who's this Steve guy, right? When Jeff calls up, they say, how can I help you, sir, mm -hmm. right? So it, it is of great benefit to have partners in this endeavor. We also have the state here. Um, Cliff was on the evaluation. Elise was here. Cindy Costello was here also. Um, 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 we talked about. Um, everybody brings their own unique experience and viewpoint to the work, and we greatly value the, these perspectives. Um, so, um, information that we gather at the site and um, information that we gather during the, uh, um, the evaluations of the site really increase our understanding of how this fuel is going to be moved off-site. Um, we compile this information into a report. So um, um, each site has its own uh, chapter in the report, and I typically will um, draft the report. Um, I will undoubtedly get something wrong about Indian Point when I write it, so therefore I send the chapter to the site for review for them to uh, clarify those things that I don't have quite right. Um, the ultimate plan is to do um, is to do evaluations of all the sites. We are at uh, 19 now. We have to go to 70. So depending on funding, um, we may move two teams to the field or even more than two teams to the field. So um, uh, we'd like to go as fast as we can in evaluating those sites. So um, here's just a little bit about the inventory information that we collect. We collect, uh, first of all, we do our bu book work and look at the Department of Energy's GC859 da database, which contains detailed information about all the fuel that's been discharged from, from the reactors. Now that da database um, is uh, um, um, the last data in it is five years old now, so we have to supplement that information with information that's obtained from the site. The type of information that we're interested in is, you know, um, burn up, enrichment, discharge date, assembly type, assembly ID number. Etc. That helps us understand when that fuel is um, eligible to be shipped. We also look at the storage systems at the site because obviously we need to interface with those systems to remove fuel from the site. We look at the number of canisters of fuel that are stored at the site. We look at the number of canisters of GTCC waste that might be stored at the site. As I said before, loading maps are really important to us. We look at things like the number of damaged fuel assemblies at the site, how those damaged fuel assemblies are packaged, and whether high burnup fuel is present at a site, and whether it's canned or not canned. Um, conditions at the site. We look at on-site tra transportation features, on-site rail, on-site roads for heavy haul trucks. We also look at the potential for barge access. We look at on-site equipment. So at some sites, because they closed a uh, many years ago, um, we see concrete casks, a concrete pad, a fence, 
and green grass. And that's really all they have at the site. Other sites, Dresden is still operating, so they have extensive infrastructure at the site, and we see everything in between. We are specifically, though, interested in things like transfer casts that are at the site, cranes, rigging, etc. We also look at staging areas at the site because uh, sites that are tighter to work at provide more constraints than sites that have a lot of area um, um, to work at. We also look at the infrastructure around uh, uh, the site, so near site rail access, uh, local roads and highways. We also look at barge access around the site. So uh, yesterday was our infrastructure day and we spent the day look, uh, seeing uh, potential tra transload locations uh, starting um, to the um, east of here and working our way back to the west. So site experience is helpful to us. As I said, we look at um, how the site has shipped large components on and off site, things like turbines, reactor vessels, et cetera. Um, Google Earth and G GISs are our friend and we take advantage of those uh, databases to understand the conditions at and near the sites. Um, as I said before, our um, evaluations of the site, the actual site visit is very, very important to us. A typical visit takes place over three days. The first day is spent at the site with the site staff, understanding the conditions at the site, understanding the inventory at the site, et cetera. Day two, is spent with the tra transportation infrastructure. And day three, this is our day three, is often spent with uh, groups as yourself in the community, understanding their issues um, around the site. So um, these are my transportation mode options so far. I've listed down through Dresden that we went to in uh, May of this year. Um, the most important thing to note on this slide is that every single site has a, uh, a way to move fuel off site. There is no truly stranded fuel in the United States. We might have some sites with direct rail access. We might have some sites with barged rail access. We might have some sites, though, that require heavy haul to rail. We even have some more co complicated sites that might require heavy haul to barge to rail, for example. Um, but every site has an option. When we um, include Indian Point in this evaluation, we, you will see a figure that has Indian Point as a row. Um, in terms of the documentation of the work, our April, yes, sir? Sorry, Steve, I didn't understand what you said, as a, as a row. Uh, in the table. As a row in the table. Oh, in the table. Uh, yes, so uh, I will add table. Indian Point below Dresden, right? No. Exactly. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I'll um, eventually, Cliff, I'm going to need to move to two sets of columns, right? I'm kind of at that point right now, I believe, because it is a bit of an eye chart, right? So, yeah, I'll be adding Indian Point as a road to this graphic. Yeah, so um, we have an April report of 2021 that's po posted on the web um, that contains information on the sites through Pilgrim. We were on a two-year break. Um, we've just gotten into the field. Um, I'll be turning in a revision at the end of this FY that includes Morris and Dresden. Um, 
Erica and I had a discussion last night about whether we could get Indian Point into this version too. We're still discussing that. I'd really, you know, I really like to get the information in the report while the getting's good and the information is hot, right? And so I really would like to get it in. Uh, it's just a question of timing and, you know, my editor's availability, et cetera, right? Um, we also continue to collect data on the sites. So it's not like we go to your site and then we don't come back for X amount of years, right? I continue to keep in contact with the people at the site to understand what changes have been made. So I've been out to uh, songs, for example, uh, three times uh, to, to, to look at new, new information out there. And as sites move through the uh, de decommissioning pro process, um, uh, uh, um, um, the conditions can change a lot, right? Um, train lines can be refurbished. Um, some infrastructure goes away. Some infrastructure is replaced, et cetera. So we continue to collect information from the sites that we've been to in the past. And as I said before, we're, we, we intend to do all the sites um, depending on funding, et cetera. So um, with that, I'll close and take any, um, yeah. I've got questions, I'll take questions. <laughs> no, um, I just want some clarification. Um, probably hear me anyhow. Yeah. Um, so you said eligible for transfer is, is so does it have to sit on site uh, on the pad for a certain amount of time before it can be transported? Tip typically, yes. So when fuel is loaded, um, it will typically be loaded three to five years after di discharge into a storage container but that's really dependent on the specific storage system that the site has chosen to use. Now, to ship it though, that requires a different container to be used. Now, the canister that's inside the storage system is the same. So the operation would look something like, I need to remove the canister from the high storm 100s that are stored on the pad, um, and I need to put that canister in a tra transportation cask. The um, license for that cask that I use to move it might require additional decay time, sometimes an additional five years for a total of 10 years, but that's very much dependent on the individual specific design of the cast that would be used to move the fuel and the characteristics of the fuel. So hotter fuel might have to sit longer than cooler fuel, for example. Okay, because I just wanted to get an idea because we're, yeah. they are uh, moving the fuel still out. So yeah. you're saying 10 to 15 years, so it depends when the last one gets loaded on. The, there's a lot of different factors, so I just wanted to kind of understand that a little better. So yeah. we're down the road a ways, way yeah. down the road. <laughs> and the only other thing is if, if we're able to get a copy of the slides of the presentation, mm -hmm. that oh, would be great. Yeah, uh, Thanks so much. Tom has got the slides. Okay, good, yeah. thanks. Right. Can I just ask a clarifying question on that, which, discussion. which is, is it, is it thermal load that's limiting the transport? Um, it can be thermal load. It can be dose rate also. It's very much dependent on what specific fuel is loaded in which specific tra transportation cast. But those are usually the two things. Now, there's some interesting exceptions, though. For stainless steel clad fuel, it can be cobalt 60 in that stainless steel clad that is the limiting factor, right? So that's more of a dose rate issue 
then it is a thermal load issue, okay. right? Um, Steve, just since we're talking about getting the, the actual um, canisters off the Indian Point site, mm -hmm. is there a transport cask that is currently licensed that can take the current canisters at Indian Point off the site? So those canisters are MPC 32s, yes, right? Yes, they are. And Holtex High Star 100 transportation cask is licensed to take MPC 32s. So they're now loading MPC 32 M's mm -hmm. um, for the last um, four loads, right? And that's what they're going to load in the future. Mm -hmm. So Holtec would need to uh, modify the High Star 100 license to incorporate the MPC 32 M's. Okay. But this is an activity that is done on a regular basis for transport systems that would be used to move fuel all across the United States. You um, add content as you need to add content. So we have uh, one particular cask in play, the NAC LWT, that has gone through 68 revisions of adding additional content. So um, it's not a constraint, it's more of a task to do in the future, right? Okay, and just kind of following up on that, it sounds as though from your presentation, the DOE is supplying the rail cars, you're supplying the security, then is the site responsible for purchasing those transport casks? No, the DOE would, would, would also supply the cask. Okay. The transportation cask. The transportation cask. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, this, is a, this is a case where words mean things, right? Mm -hmm. So there's the transportation cask, there's the dry storage canister that would go within the transportation cask, and then there's the dry storage system, but you will often hear those referred to as vertical concrete casks. Mm -hmm. That's not the same thing. Yeah, we're <laughs> that, not that, taking those for a ride. Yeah, right? those are correct. Standard. Absolutely yeah. correct. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So in part of our consent-based siting efforts, um, we're looking at um, stakeholder tools to help explain the difference between these components. And I myself would like to see an animated thing where, you know, the fuel started out in the reactor, got moved to the fuel, got moved to the can canister, got moved to the pad inside the vertical concrete cask. You know, a whole series of, you know, the various steps animated so that folks could actually see what takes place to um, uh, get the fuel out of the reactor in a canister onto the pad into a cask and actually move. Thank you, Steve. I have a, a question. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> is there any other plant that will have as many spent fuel rods as Indian Point because we have three plants there? Uh, actually, I don't know what really happened with all the fuel rods from Indian Point One. They're on the pad. They're on the pad. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we've got three plants. Do we have more than anybody else, and should uh, we not be prioritized because of that? First of all, you're not going to have more than ev everybody else. Uh, not. No. No. Um, so, for example, uh, Sa San Onofre is going to have a comparable number of assemblies, right? Um, pa Palo Verde, though, in, in Arizona is an operating plant with th three units on site. <coughs> and they've been operating for many years. And they will probably, in the end, have the most fuel. But that depends on when they close down, right? That depends on how things go. So that's a very difficult thing to predict. Um, so you will not have the highest number, but on the other hand, you're not going to have the
the smallest number either. Right, and we also are close to the biggest city, right? <laughs> You're close to a big city, yeah, absolutely you are, yes. Okay, I'm just trying to put, put us on the list of priorities. <laughs> then <clears throat> two other things, I think Erica mentioned uh, <clears throat> dose exposure and you know in moving could you explain that a little bit because I didn't think that would be a problem I mean I wouldn't say it's a problem it's just something that we have to evaluate um, so the the material you know spent nuclear fuel is radioactive and it's contained within the canisters and the transportation cask uh, we have to take measurements to ensure that it meets federal regulations that allow it to be transported. We'll have to do environmental analyses uh, as part of the whole operation of the system uh, under uh, the National Environmental uh, Policy Act. Uh, and so we need to, to quantify what the dose is. Uh, and there will be some dose, but it's on the order of, you know, units of 10 to the minus, you know, 10. Uh, very, very small levels. But we need to know what it is uh, so that it can be evaluated. How far ahead do you have to do that? Uh, in terms of, I mean, we, we, do that, we do that continuously. We have other modeling tools that we have that um, collects data on the loading configurations of fuel at, at all the nuclear power plants and can model the decay rates um, and do estimates of, of what the you know, expected dose will be of a given canister of fuel at a given period of time in the future. Um, in terms of when, uh, when you know, a formalized process, uh, when we license uh, a federal interim storage facility, we'll have to do an environmental impact statement. Um, and it, it would be expected that some, some amount of that would be incorporated as part of the environmental impact assessment. And just one other, Steve. I mean, it was, uh, you made a comment about you only got 25% of the knowledge from the pieces of paper right. uh, that you looked at. Um, Weren't the, wasn't it the responsibility of all the nuclear plants to always update their mapping and their changes and everything else? So, I mean, well, that kind of surprised me. That's what the GC859 uh, provides us, right? It provides us the detailed information on the spent nuclear fuel. But that just says, here's what's stored at the site, right? That doesn't tell me the people part of it. It doesn't tell me how they've moved large, heavy things on and off the site. That doesn't tell me the condition of the infrastructure at the site. That doesn't tell me, you know, I need to transload at this location as opposed to that location. So there's data. That's the fuel. We have a lot of that information. But it is also true that there's a human element, too of um, understanding um, how this fuel is actually going to be moved. Mm -hmm. and, and one thing we found through this is, is the, uh, the various communities have different approaches. Uh, generally speaking, in the Northeast, we've seen that uh, communities tend to be more uh, uh, amenable to marching, whereas in the Midwest, that seems to be kind of a third rail. Uh, and, and so I, I think a lot of what we find out while we're here is understand what the community is comfortable with and, and, um, it, it, and of course, what, what transportation infrastructure is available to, to meet those expectations. Mm -hmm. So just as a follow-up to that, when you're looking at these transportation options, you mentioned mm -hmm. road, rail, barge. Mm -hmm. If there aren't facilities in place, do you look at the feasibility of constructing something? Um, so, um, uh, in terms of transload locations, there are no real facilities in place anywhere, right? So what we more look at for transload locations is available room to work and access to the location. So I need an area adjacent to train tracks that has enough space that I can secure it, enough space so that I can bring rail cars in on trucks. That might, that might, yeah. Yeah, right, right. We're not bringing rail cars on Yeah, yeah, right, sorry, sorry. Um, that might mean several thousand feet of track, right? So 
it's more like that, understanding what the infrastructure looks like today, right? Yeah, and I'd also say, well, we're not looking to build new inter interstates or anything of that nature. If there is uh, infrastructure that might need a little polish or a little refurbishment uh, to be available for use, that's certainly things that we would consider. Um, we'll have to do, you know, an analysis of alternatives and look at, you know, the various options and costs and, and operational considerations for them. Um, you know, we've also thought about, you know, there could be circumstances where maybe a public-private partnership to refurbish it, it or install infrastructure could make sense. Um, so there's a variety of options that, that we'll look at at a case-by-case -case basis. Not that I don't care about rail and, <laughs> and roads, but my focus is more on, on the barging that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, just in terms of facilities and, and impacts to the Hudson River. So are you on Team Bard? <laughs> or, yeah. um, well, it all depends on what you propose. <laughs> okay, okay. Good answer. Great answer. Good answer. <laughs> so um, Westchester County has a fairly um, uh, comprehensive and sophisticated GIS uh, mm -hmm. mapping and database system. If that would be of interest to you or uh, valuable to you, let us know and we can connect you with that. Yeah, thank you. Sure, great. I, I have a quickie, I mean, just on barging, I think I, 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 I work, represent Riverkeeper on this uh, this uh, board and uh, I think generally we'd be skeptical of barging options mm -hmm. unless there was no other option. Uh, but generally the idea of having something potentially sink in the Hudson is not, uh, not something we're a fan <laughs> of. Um, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I have a couple of questions. So, so specifically on the site, on site itself, I mean, you know, the, we've seen the, uh, the, the high pressure gas lines there. I assume they're a constraint on trucking, right? Um, it depends on which entrance at the site that you exit from. So the, um, the spent fuel st storage pad is at the north of the end, end of the site. Mm -hmm. If we were to take the north entrance from the site and then turned north onto Broadway, then we would bypass the gas lines altogether, which would be further to the south. Um, so in that scenario, we would, um, we would not be as concerned about the gas lines if we use one of the middle entrance or the southern entrance or if we turned south onto Broadway for some reason. But um, this is going to be a super load in the state of New York. So the cask will weigh somewhere around three, three, 300,000 pounds, right? So it will need to be permitted by the state and they, uh, the, that permit will need to consider impacts on the infrastructure that that weight might have. So um, we anticipate that there, you know, just because we miss the gas line at Indian Point doesn't mean that we right. won't hit, we won't be over a gas line in some other location, right? But the presence of those lines would have to be considered in the pr permitting pr process, right? Okay, thanks. And final, my final question is, uh, one issue I've heard about CIS is having to transport twice, right? So you have to transport to CIS and then from CIS to some repository in the future. How does that change the risk scenario? Um, I, I think it, your mic. oh, sorry. In general, we, we hear a lot of concern about the transportation of spent nuclear fuel. Um, the reality is that both in this country and internationally, spent nuclear fuel has been regularly transported since about the 1940s. Um, there have been transportation accidents, certainly. Uh, there have been fatalities with transportation accidents not related to the radiological nature of the fuel, just head-on collisions and things of that nature. Uh, so the perception of the risk is generally much higher. 
uh, but the actual risk uh, based on the, the measured experience of transporting spent nuclear fuel in this country is, is quite low. Uh, again, because so many precautions are taken, because the, uh, you know, there, there are specialized vehicles used, a lot of planning, a lot of emergency response training, and, and these type B packages that are the mo most robust packages that you can use. So there, there is certainly a, a perception challenge uh, with transporting fuel more than once. Um, but in terms of the department's planning, we don't see that to be a significant challenge. Um, I didn't hear the answer to my question, I'm sorry, which was, what's the relative risk of going straight to repository versus going to CIS then repository? I mean, th there is a risk difference for sure because there is some non-zero risk. Uh, so it is higher. I don't, I don't have the numbers for you right now. That's certainly things that we will evaluate as part of our, uh, our environmental assessments that we'll have to evaluate alternatives. Uh, I, I can't give you a number, but it's something we would follow up on in the future. Uh, just, just the nature of transportation, whether you're transporting spent nuclear fuel or you're transporting widgets, uh, more transport is more risk, uh, just, just the nature of the activity. Uh, so yes, I will say the transport is more. I can't say it's significantly more. So explain to me what would CIS, because I, I understand CIS is going through licensing right now. Right, but that's not DOE doing that licensing, right? No. So at what point, if you decide to use CIS, at what point do you do the, do you do the, the risk assessment and the, the environmental assessment after the CIS has been licensed? So, so I believe what you're talking about are there are two private companies that are, have pursued licenses from the Nuclear Regulatory right. Commission for private uh, consolidated interim storage facilities. Uh, th those are private initiatives. Uh, the U.S. Department of Energy has been directed by Congress to pursue a federal interim storage facility, and that's what we are currently doing. We're uh, currently uh, starting our siting process. Yeah, okay. uh, so these are, are parallel activities, not uh, interrelated activities. So you wouldn't buy storage at those facilities? Uh, that's not currently in our plans, no, because Congress specified that we have to pursue a federal interim storage facility. So who would be the customers for those facilities? I mean, I, I, I'm not involved in those facilities, and those aren't Department of Energy facilities, I mean, I think I'm sort of yeah, maybe I mean, I'm making a statement through a question, which is I think DOE could be only, the only possible customer, basically, maybe the military as well. The government is the only possible customer, so those, those companies must be anticipating I mean, from uh, the public a potential market for this, for this uh, facility. I mean, possibly, uh, you know, the, again, that's currently not in the Department of Energy's plans. Uh, from their public presentation materials, uh, there, there has been sort of a, a new model in nuclear power plant decommissioning, um, which you see at Indian Point, where specialty companies will buy out the whole plant and do the decommissioning. My understanding from, from Holtec's particular model is that their plan would be to trans transport fuel from the sites that they've decommissioned to their private interim storage facility. Um, and I think similarly with the facility in Texas, uh, it's a little bit of a different model, but they do have partnerships with decommissioning companies. I, I don't know what their current plans are. That's just based on past public presentations that they've given. Right, I'm still, I'm, let me, I'm gonna get one more question, which is, so I still don't understand this. So, so is Holtec, I mean, if, it seems like if DOE is gonna do all this for free, why would Holtec pay for it? I mean, you'd have to ask them what, what, their, what yeah. their business plan is. <laughs> they <yuck them> out. <laughs> Neither is any spent fuel. <laughs> That's a whole tech question. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. have, uh, have you interfaced with the Institute for Nuclear Power Operations? They maintain a, a system that used to be or may still be called EPIX, Equipment Performance Index Exchange, that has a lot of history on crane accidents, movement, yeah, crane accidents. Yeah, um, obviously to um, to um, move fuel into a tra transportation cask, in a lot of cases we're going to need to do lifts, right? And so crane accidents are going to have to be something that is considered in the loading process. Now, um, that would be more of a utility process at the site as opposed to a Department of Energy process at the site. But, you know, the DOE is going to have to work together with the utility to get this fuel safely loaded. And so, um, yeah, we're aware of, of their work, yeah. Okay. Uh, unrelated question, but the consent-based policy, 
Is that just the two endpoints, or is that also the potential routes in between? Oh, thanks for the question. Yes, so there is not consent for transportation the same way there is for a long-term fixed facility, um, and that's for, for practical as well as you know uh, legal reasons. Uh, however, there are many avenues for state, tribal, and local uh, entities to have involvement in things like route selection. Uh, and I also mentioned previously that in the Department of Energy's transportation model, we would also provide resources, technical resources and training resources uh, to the communities long transport routes for emergency responder training and things of that nature. And that's, that's a longstanding model that the department's used for its radi radioactive material transportation, and we would follow that model. Uh, for the, things like route selection, we often get a lot of questions about how routes will be determined. Uh, for highway routes, you have local and state, and in some cases, tribal permitting um, that would influence the route. If you're transporting on a highway, uh, states and tribes have the ability to designate preferred routes for transport of hazardous material. You know, as Steve mentioned, these shipments in New York, if they're highway shipments, are going to be superloads, so you'll go through a, a permitting process with the state for those superloads. Uh, for rail transports, uh, that's uh, regulated by the federal, um, by the U.S. Department of Transportation. It's actually a rule that was uh, promulgated by the Pipeline and Hazardous Material Safety Administration, but it's enforced by the Federal Railroad Administration. It's a rail routing rule specific to hazardous materials. Um, there's there's uh, 27 different criteria that the rail carriers have to factor in when identifying routes for hazardous material. One of the factors that they have to consider is in, um, seeking information from states and tribes about security uh, concerns along the route. So there are, um, it's not a process that you know, is undertaken independently of, of state, tribal, and local jurisdictions. There, there are certainly processes for involvement in that process, but there, is, there isn't consent for transportation the same way that there is for, for again, a long-term a long fixed facility. Okay, the reason I ask that, I live in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and I'd just soon not wave at all this stuff going by. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather go through Columbus, Ohio, perhaps, <laughs> <than> north of me. <laughs> That's where I live. That's why you... <laughs> <laughs> Coincidence. <laughs> Hi. Um, so there's uh, the members of the decommissioning oversight board. You know, we hear about all sorts of topics, but the you mm -hmm. know the board specifically hears uh, often about the pipelines, which you've discussed a little bit, and then also the presence of the elementary school near the site. And I was just right. wondering if um, you've discussed the pipelines. Is the elementary school something that is at all considered in the analysis that you've been performing this week? Uh, uh, n not specifically. Um, again, the, the tool that I presented, the stakeholder tool for assessing radioactive transportation, we include what we term sensitive population groups, so things like schools, daycares, nursing homes, um, and, and other type of those facilities. Uh, so we in certainly include that in our, in our overall analysis. Um, we didn't do any site-specific look at the, at the elementary school during this trip. Okay. Um, so I, I suppose it's just more of a comment, but just for your own edification, those, those, are, those are two issues that sure. I think are of uh, particular sensitivity to the community here, and to the extent your consideration of those factors is documented and reflected in, in the, the final report, I think that might help uh, you know, bolster the credibility of, uh, of the, the findings that you make from this. Understood. And, and another, going back to, to Mr. Lockbaum's question, uh, you, what, some of the things that we've talked about with communities is, is scheduling of shipments. Uh, off hours, whether it's, you know, in some communities that say, say in, in, when you talk to Indiana, don't schedule shipments during the Indy 500, all of our emergency response assets are otherwise engaged. You know, and, and, and for some of our tribal communities that have powwows or large gatherings, don't have shipments come through when we have those large gatherings. Um, those are all those are all things that we're planning to accommodate. Um, you know, I understand as an example in New York, there were there were shipments out of a Navy facility, the Kessel Ring facility, and the rail spur that they load on is is similar is near is right next to an elementary school. And I understand that they worked with the community to schedule those for off hours. And so, um, th those are certainly uh, considerations that can be can be worked in for us as well. Um, I have some questions on what a few of the things that you just mentioned. Sure. So just going back to what Richard was asking you about with regard to the parallel tracks for these private companies that mm -hmm. are setting up consolidated interim storage versus now the federal government setting it up. Mm -hmm. Is there any precedent for private companies transporting spent nuclear fuel across Absolutely. the country? Absolutely. There is. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, private companies have routinely transported. I mean, so one question here is, do we mean uh, actually doing the transport or do we mean uh, being the shipper? 
And the answer to both questions is yes. Okay. Uh, because, and for the Department of Energy as well, it's not going to be me driving the train or driving the truck. We'll, we'll employ, uh, you know, heavy hauling companies, commercial rail companies, and things of that nature. Uh, and, and for, in terms of the shippers being private companies, uh, utilities have transported spent nuclear fuel. Um, actually, from Indian Point, spent nuclear fuel was transported to West Valley um, back in the day. What was it? A, a couple, in the 1970s. A couple hundred assemblies. Yeah. Um, other plants um, have down in, um, you know, one of the more recent examples was down in the Carolinas. Um, they transferred fuel between plants because one plant had a much larger fuel pool. Um, that they could move to, so so it, okay. it's it's definitely ha it's not necessarily a daily occurrence, um, but but in addition, uh, you know, going back to the DOE shipping, DOE ships, uh, we have research reactors around the country, we have our national laboratory facilities. There's research quantities of spent nuclear fuel that move, um, you know, res in MIT in in Cambridge, they have a research reactor, and so spent fuel is moved out of there routinely. Um, and again, those, those are private companies are contracted by the department for department shipments typically, unless they're classified or, or high security. Um, and, and that's what we would use as well. We would use private, sh we would use commercial uh, carriers for those shipments. Okay, okay. And then throughout this meeting this morning, I've kind of heard a switch back and forth. So I just wanna clarify. When you are looking at this initiative to develop a federal consolidated interim storage facility, is it a facility or facilities plural? It's one or more. One, one or, more. or more. Yes. So you could be looking at multiple consolidated storage areas across yes. the country. Yeah. As we go through the consent-based siting process, <coughs> it'll come down to you know how many volunteers we get. Uh, we'll also look at analysis. Uh, you know, analysis of alternatives. Does it make sense to have maybe east-west? facilities, north-south facilities, things of that nature. Uh, we're certainly not planning on having dozens of facilities because there's also just a, an efficiency, you know, an economic efficiency uh, facet of it. But at this time, it's, it's one or more. Okay. All right. And then just looping back to something that I think um, we were referencing earlier, during my time in this field, there's always this talk of the queue. Sure. Right, the DOE queue. <laughs> and everyone kind of talks about it, and it's this right. mythical list that I've never actually seen. <laughs> and so when we talk about the timing mm -hmm. for DOE right. to come and pick up the fuel from, and I know we're down near Indian Point, but my question is, I, I would like you to respond to, for all of the New York State plants as well, because we have upstate plants that we are concerned with as well. When we talk about picking up this fuel, mm -hmm. where is Indian Point on this list? And, uh, and how do you develop the list? Sure. Uh, so I can tell you what I know. I, I'd say the, the overarching answer is I don't know. And part of that is because, yes, there is a list, but there's also uh, uh, you know, some companies own multiple plants, and the right. allocation is not necessarily to a specific site. It's to a company. Um, and so they have flexibility in how they would, would use their allocations. So it is like the companies are lined up on the list, not necessarily the sites? I mean, it is the sites, but it goes to the companies, and companies can have flexibility to, to move their allocations between sites that they own. Uh, and, and, and that said, you know, this is a very complex issue that goes back to contracts and things like that, and I am not an expert on it. Um, from a transportation planning standpoint, you know, we've certainly identified that there are uh, you know, the, the long-standing plan, as you refer to the queue, that was developed in a time when it was expected to be truck ship, legal weight truck shipments routinely transported from all the nuclear power plant sites. Uh, many decades have passed and we're now talking about much larger containers and many sites decommissioned. Mm -hmm. um, so from a strictly, you know, transport efficiency standpoint, um, you know, there's maybe uh, other ways that you would approach this. Uh, and so, uh, our plan is to have ongoing discussions about that uh, to see if uh, we are, uh, you know, going to continue on the path that has been laid previously of this queue of shipping. It's, it's the oldest fuel first queue, or whether we can um, look at alternatives that may be more efficient in terms of from a transportation operation standpoint, um, because. Uh, the, the system that was previously laid out, again, because it was based on routine shipments, legal weight truck, you know, just much more simpler operations, not looking at super loads and things of that nature, not looking at uh, shut down nuclear power plants. Uh, and so those are things that we evaluate. We certainly evaluate, you know, different, different options and different considerations. One of the things for us is if you follow that strict queue, you're going to end up with more overall shipments. 
Right. Um, because if you're transporting smaller quantities of fuel, uh, then you're going to have to do, you know, and, and when I say shipment, I mean, you know, we're planning primarily to transport by train or, or, you know, to connections to train. And so it's more efficient to transport five or seven packages on a train than one at a time um, kind of thing. But again, we're not the, you know, that, those are future discussions that definitely need to be had. Um, but there aren't any, any firm, you know, there aren't any final decisions on that at this point. Okay. And I appreciate that response. And I think that in, I'd like to respond not necessarily with a question, but with a statement. Because I know from your end, this is a future issue that you're trying to figure out and plan out with regard to dates. But we here in New York State are planning now sure. for decommissioning funding, not only at the Indian Point sites, but upstate as well. Mm -hmm. And in order for those licensees to plan, they have to have dates. Absolutely. So, and, 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 and I, I know they have dates and that you work with the companies to develop those dates. Mm -hmm. However, the state and the community, local communities, we are not, to my knowledge, in those conversations. So we have to take the licensee's word for it that for right now it's 2042 or for right now it's 2050. And um, from the state's viewpoint, it would be very helpful if we were involved in those conversations and those updates. Because when the DOE tells a Constellation or Holtec, hey, it's not gonna be 2035 anymore, it's gonna be 2045 per this long process that we're having, I think that we'd like to be looped in on that sooner rather than later, mm -hmm. because it all goes into decommissioning funding, decommissioning spending, and how we're gonna be using that money going forward. So I think that that's just something um, from the state's viewpoint that we'd really like to be kept in the loop on as we go forward. Sure, and, and I'll say in direct response to that comments, th there are no dates currently. There just aren't any. Um, I think there were dates in the past um, when the Yucca Mountain Project was active based on the projected completion timeline for the Yucca Mountain Project and there were dates extrapolated from that. But when that project was discontinued, you know, and there were no, no progress was being made on any destination facility. And when I say destination facility, I mean an interim storage facility or a disposal facility. Uh, so, you know, you could, you know, dates are used sometimes for economic analysis and just saying, if you started tomorrow, it would take this long. Right. But nobody was starting tomorrow. So uh, dates are thrown out, but I'd say they're not, you know, they're used for, for planning, for economic planning purposes, and, and that's understood that that's something that needs to happen. But I'd say that any date that anybody has right at this time is, it has a high level of uncertainty. Uh, and so I'd say what, when we do start to have more dates, and again, because we're going through a consent-based siting process and there's a lot of uncertainty in the timeline of that process because it is very much a community-led and it depends, you know, do we spend, uh, you know, we say 10 to 15 years and that's a very ballpark time frame. Uh, you know, we might get, 20 communities to volunteer next year, and maybe that's a shorter time frame. It may take five, six, seven years uh, to, to do enough outreach and engagement. It also depends on the resources that we have to do that effort as well. Uh, so, you know, 10 to 15 years to start this process is the best time frame we have right now. I think as we move through the process, we'll be updating, you know, what that expected time frame is. Once we get, uh, you know, one or more sites that have agreed to host this facility and we enter the licensing uh, process, we'll have more, uh, more confidence in the timeline because the, we have good data on what the licensing timeline would be, what the construction timeline would be, and things like that. And I will say just for planning purposes, maybe not to the time frame that you're looking for, but for the department, uh, as I mentioned before, the department will, will provide technical assistance and training resources to, to states and tribes along the transportation route. The department's current policy for that, uh, which is from 2008 and not yet finalized, is to provide notification to governors uh, five years in advance of when shipments would begin, notifying them that they're eligible to apply for those funds. So it's not going to be a situation where like, oh, by the way, next week we're gonna be transporting that spent nuclear fuel. There will be some lead time for, for planning and preparedness, but if you're, if you're looking at, you know, a, a, a strict number on when a given plant is going to be moving fuel, we, we just don't have that at this time. Okay. Thank but you thanks for your question. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's good to know that that's something Can that the, the state is interested in. Can I follow up on that? Um, <clears throat> the, um, if, if, is Holtec one of the people reaching out to you to say they want to do an interim storage? Uh, they, the site? they are pursuing their own, their own facility. 
Okay, so if they pursue their own facility, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> I think they're basically, well, they have a lot of plants in the Northeast, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> so it might be somewhere around here. Then they could start the process sooner because they, you know, they've got a site. If, if you, you have to approve their site, I guess, no, right? No, no. You don't have to approve it. So the U.S. Okay. Department of Energy has the responsibility of the commercial <coughs> nuclear fuel, uh, but we have, th th that's it. That's the, the beginning and end of our responsibility in relation to the nuclear power plants. Uh, if a company such as Holtec or any other decides to uh, you know, license and construct a facility and they meet the, the regulatory framework under the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, then that's entirely independent of what the Department of Energy is doing. So is that something that we should be advocating for? Uh, the site that Erica is referring to for Holtec is in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. And oh, I mean, that's uh, what they said, that yeah. is what they are pursuing. <coughs> uh, I can't speak to exactly where it is in the NRC licensing process. I don't think the NRC has approved it yet. They no. did approve the one in Texas. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's my understanding that New Mexico and Texas are both pushing back very mm -hmm. hard on the idea of interim consolidated spent fuel storage at those locations. So there wasn't one, I thought maybe they were something in the Northeast, maybe they were even looking at some nuclear plant to do the storage for everybody else? No, no, Good. that's I just. That's yeah. So their um, EIS, their final environmental impact statement for that whole tech site was released two weeks ago approximately. So that's available from the NRC. Can I, can I pick up on this though? It seems like, you know, conceptually you have like 90 something interim storage facilities in place right now. They're called reactor sites. Right? 70 something, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> 70 something, right. What's the point of going down to six? I, I'm not sure where the six number comes from. Or oh, whatever. One, one two, you okay. know. <laughs> what's, the point of, what's the point of going for, to, from 70 something sites to a few sites? What, what do you actually gain? So, so for the department, it's the department's responsibility and the department needs to fulfill its responsibility. Uh, in addition, it's what Congress has authorized and directed us to do, and, and that's uh, you know, it's kind of the function of the executive branch is to, is to do what's been authorized and, and uh, funded by Congress. Uh, from more of a sort of what's the logic behind it, um, uh, you, you probably know that there have been, uh, there's been litigation around uh, the, the federal government being in partial breach of contract. There were contract signs that the department would pick up the spent nuclear fuel. The department's been found in partial breach and there's been long going litigation um, that's amounted to, I believe, about $9 billion has right. been paid out and that's tax, taxpayer money has been paid right. out. Uh, so, so part of the logic of, of pursuing consolidated interim storage, at least from a fe for a federal facility, is to reduce the future liabilities. Well, couldn't, you just buy the, couldn't you just buy the facilities? I mean, the, again, we can only do what we're authorized and funded to do. We are currently not authorized or funded to purchase uh, private nuclear power plant facilities. I mean, you <coughs> just call them interim storage facilities than you, you are, right? Again. <laughs> you're authorized to set up, you're authorized to spend money setting up an interim storage facility, so, you know. We're authorized to site a federal facility. Right. That's Inside. our specific authorization. Or, or more. One or more. One or more. So site 76. Right. You're done. Then, so, I, then I think the economic logic there is, is not borne out. Well, that's what I'm trying to get to, right? Which, what, what is the logic? Is it a risk reduction logic? Is it an economic logic? Is it a security logic? Like, what's the logic? Well, the logic from Congress was probably a political logic right. based on the pressure from the host communities mm -hmm. to have the federal government take on the responsibility as promised, right? right? right. So right. right. Well, let me ask it a different way. Is there, any, uh, is there any logic apart from politics? I mean, th there is some economic logic from the from the federal government standpoint, again, because if you can uh, develop and implement consolidated interim storage to reduce future liabilities, then you are saving the taxpayers money. Plus, this, once the, it, the fuel has been removed, the site can go on to whatever life right. after That's nuclear That's another facet, right. that so in, so, in some the cases community. there's right. interest in converting right. uh, the decommissioned nuclear power plants to, to other economic yeah. uses, right. That's you the know, political industrial interest, uses. right? That's yeah. the right. political interest. Right. That's not yeah. necessarily yeah. Right. a bad word, political. Right. Yeah, and, and because, uh, you know, as you mentioned, right. that 
that communities are, are advocating to get this fuel out of their right. communities, and, and it is the, the Department of Energy's responsibility, so also right. fulfilling the Department of Energy's responsibility. But all this assumes you can't do a repository, right? I mean, it's basically, the inherent assumption is that a repository is not happening, or it's happening very slowly. I mean, we don't assume that we can't do a repository. We're currently not authorized to work on any repository. I'm just saying, it would be a waste of money spending a lot of taxpayers' money setting up interim storage if, if a repository would follow two years later, right? But yes, absolutely. But because we're currently not working on a repository, and if work did start on a repository, the estimated time frame for that would be probably minimum of 30 years. Uh, the rationale for doing interim storage is it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a shorter time frame for the government to be able to accept the spent nuclear fuel. Well, in, in my view, hopefully you would, in parallel, begin work on a repository. Uh, we certainly recognize that, that interim storage is not a final solution. It's an interim solution, and you need disposal. Uh, to reach a final solution for this material. Going back We're to already Bruce. spending money mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. annually to store fuel mm -hmm. at these sites, right? Right, right, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Going back to Bridget's questions about the Q placement, does the plant's operational status, is that a factor in where the plant, because a permanently shut down plant, it differs significantly from a plant that continues to generate fuel that goes into dry storage? That's an interesting question. Uh, you know, as written, uh, there, there is, it appears to be some avenue to prioritize removing fuel from shutdown sites. That's not been the department's longstanding policy. Again, those, those are ongoing discussions about whether that needs to be looked at and, and whether that would be a change the department might make in the future. It wasn't that one of the two presidents ago, the Blue Ribbon Commission's that, that was a recommendation by the Blue Ribbon Commission, absolutely. Okay. So can I have a go back on the elementary school? The one that you're talking about is the Buchanan for Plank Elementary School, correct? Yes. And um, are the, um, the McKinley School is closed, from what I understand? The McKinley School is now, it was labor. bought out by a labor union, so it's not used as a school anymore. Okay, and Franklin School is in Montrose, which is, would be within probably the mile radius. Also, is that closed? Also, no, that's open. Okay, that's open. and then the Hendrick Hudson High School is also okay. right next to the Frank G. Lindsay in Montrose, on the border of Buchanan. And Woodside, Woodside Elementary School is a little that's bit further out away. In Furn yeah, that's out a little further. That's in Furnace Woods. Okay, thank you. And I also do want to mention, you know, we're talking about the schools, of course, we're all concerned about safety, but as you know, you've been on site, and if you're going to come out of the original entrance, which was the entrance number one, right at the intersection of Broadway and Blakely, you see there's a lot of houses there. There's residential. So just to keep them in mind, we won't want to forget anybody. <laughs> right, and and, um, I'm on team barge, so you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, and entrance number one is the northernmost entrance? Yes, the northernmost okay, entrance. So it's right at that intersection. Thank because you. you see our infrastructure there, our roads are not the greatest. It's a little narrow, Broadway. But also, we have a sheetrock plant just next door to. Uh, so the, the road's taking a beating as it is, and with that extra heavy, you know, mm -hmm. pressure on it. I, I don't know, you know, so. Mm -hmm. But you're the experts. You'll figure it out. Thank you. We appreciate it. And this is it. the sheetrock plant that's just to the south of the site? Yes. It's, uh, it's right. changed names over the last couple of years, but it's certainty. So they, co they come out with some heavy loads, and they do come in front of the, uh, the Indian Point property to get right. up on to that extension, uh, Louisa Street. So I, I, I just think in what I know about the infrastructure, not only in the village, but I think once you get up to that entrance, you go left. That's, you're, t you're going north on nine, um, right. the bridge, Fishkill, Hopewell, uh, Poughkeepsie, right. um, going down. The only way you'd have to, if you needed to get to New Jersey, <coughs> where there's another rail area, uh, you would be going most likely over the uh, Tappan Zee. I still call it the Tappan Zee. I'm an old timer here. I can't, I can't change things. So I still call it the Tappan Zee Bridge. Right. <laughs> right. The way that we drove the route was uh, we went... Um, north on Broadway, and then we headed um, east on Louisa, and then we got on Route 9, which, um, you know, we, we, we would have to get the cask under 
that Route 9 overpass in order to make the left turn to go north. Yeah. Might be tricky. Yeah. And so that was one turn. of the things that we used our dashboard camera to film, right? Oh, okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So since this is day three and you're meeting with community, who else are you meeting with today? Oh, uh, we're meeting actually with the state of New York to do a deeper dive on tra transportation issues. Um, we were only able to bring um, five state folks to the site visit, but there's many more that wanted to uh, chat, right? Mm -hmm. And so we're going to have a meeting at the, um, with the State Department of tra Transportation talking to both the rail and the highway folks and the folks that do the per permitting of the uh, trucks, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the major things is to understand their, their specific concerns. But um, it's very, um, um, it's very, um, it makes our life easy when you all have a group like this that aggregates community members into one body right, so that we can meet with y'all at once, right, mm -hmm. and not have to schedule individual meetings. This has, been, this has been good for us because we got a chance to hear a lot of different interests mm -hmm. at, at this single meeting. Mm -hmm. Good. Are you going to Poughkeepsie then, next? Um, no, I'm going to the, um, just a second. Um, yeah. Oh, oh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's the meeting location. Right. <laughs> so just to confirm, Yucca Mountain, done, dead deal, not happening. The, the department's currently not authorized or funded to do any work on Yucca Mountain. The current administration has indicated no support for it. Okay. You know, I, I can't speak to what, what could come yeah, in the future. Yeah, who knows? Yeah, there's yeah. a lot of, yeah. Cur currently no activity and okay. no plans for activity. Okay, thank right. you. Um, I'll follow up just briefly on uh, Sandy's comment earlier about uh, the possibility of state advocacy uh, as far as uh, interim storage uh, and siting of that. Um, so any site, whether it's a private site or one cited by, by DOE, is necessarily within a state. So there is, there does end up being a sensitivity with the notion of New York State advocating for citing uh, 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 of, of a facility in another state that is uh, reluctant or, or, or opposed to do, doing that. Um, however, we, uh, we do support the consent-based citing initiative that uh, DOE is, is in the process of. Uh, we, the, the state did submit uh, a response to DOE's RFI. Um, on that process, uh, so, you know, supporting the process, providing some suggestions in re uh, response to the specific questions that DOE asked, um, and also asking for certain, you know, uh, clarification on how the process would work, you know, what, what consent really means, you know, does that mean uh, unanimous agreement by all of the community members, does it mean just a majority, um, you know, how are the, uh, who, who who are identified as, as you know, who gets a vote, uh, those sorts of things. So, so there is state, uh, state advocacy, advocacy going on, but it, it really is focused on communities that uh, would be willing hosts. Mm -hmm. okay. You'll never get unanimous support on anything. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, you're gonna, yeah, and, yeah. and, and everyone knows. We have knows. unanimous support for Sandy's proposition. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone knows it's the NIMBY. Not in my backyard, so yeah, there's challenges. Right. Don't we know it? Yeah. <laughs> Steve mentioned earlier the animation to help explain some of these terms. Yeah. I think that's a great idea. Thank and you. I, I'm yeah. kicking myself for not having done that long ago, so I, I think that's a great idea. I think it would pay for itself many times over. Thank you. Since I'm not paying for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have grand plans for lots of communication and digital hours in the day to get them all done. But yeah, I think, I think that comment. So 
So that's one of the reasons that we take all the photos when we go on a site evaluation. One reason is to document the current conditions of the infrastructure and things like that. But another reason is it really helps people to understand what a site looks like and feels like, you know, if we have a lot of photos. So um, that's, that's one of the primary reasons that we, that we do it, right? So Indian Point was your 19th site. Yeah. Uh, is there anything after your three days here yeah. that stands out in your mind that uh, is maybe different at Indian Point than some of the other sites that you've seen? Or is it very much like many of the other sites? I, I just am wondering if there's, if there's gonna be any, uh, when you do write up this report, if there's anything very different with the Indian Point site? So, every site is unique, right? Absolutely true. There's no um, cookie cutter site out there, right? Every site is unique. Every site has its own issues. You know, Indian Point's issues are, um, you know, there's no direct ra rail access, right? But that's the same as many other sites across the United States. Humboldt Bay does not have direct rail access. Other sites, Yankee Row does not have direct rail access. Um, there's, there's many other sites in the US that do not have direct rail access, right? Um, the length of the uh, potential heavy haul uh, to get to access, I think would be similar to the length that we would see at Oyster Creek. A lot of the infrastructure in both New Jersey and New York, at least in this, this area, runs north-south, right? And so um, it makes um, it, um, it um, if it ran east-west, it would be more convenient to us, right? <laughs> But that's just not what's out there. You got to dance with who who bought you, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yeah. Uh, another interesting question would be: um, Do we see any show-stopping constraints? And the answer to that is no, absolutely not. Okay. You know, so that's a really good thing, right? We see fuel in canisters that's able to be shipped. We see that fuel correlated to a tr transportation cask. We see railroads, maybe not up to the front gate of the site, but fairly nearby. We see a site that um, is moving waste by rail currently. So there's experience, recent. Um, so that, that, that's a really good thing. Um, we see that barge slip. For those of you on Team Barge, <laughs> um, yeah, so um, there's no showstoppers. There's nothing that says um, this fuel is utterly stranded. You know, that figure that I put up before yes. that had the, you know, there's, there's options here, right? Okay, thank you. Actually, that, that does trigger a quick question with me, which is the old, the old fuel from IP1, I think it was Carl up years ago. Are there transport costs for the old, for the old uh, fuel as well? For the so, so you're talking about the um, 160 assemblies of Indian Point One fuel that's stainless steel clad, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that is currently in the High Star 100 COC. If you look in if you look in the documentation for that, that's denoted the 14 by 14 E is in Edward okay. fuel. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, that's that's in 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 the current a lot uh, ca cask license. Right, and, and for the canister that's in, is there a transport cask? For the MPC 32. No, oh, it's in it's in the same canister. Yeah, okay. yeah. Right. Right. yeah, yeah. It's in the same. Yeah, it's a little bit shorter fuel though, right? So that's why when you go out on the pad, you see the st storage units are shorter. Right, right, uh, right. Yeah, yeah. 
and it's definitely old and cold. <laughs> Well, I think um, we're probably running to time. Um, any other questions before we wrap up? This has been very informative, and we really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.